Welcome to a Penn State College of Communications digital tutorial. There are some fundamental but important skills a photographer must master before they can move forward. This tutorial will cover exposure, getting the right amount of light onto the camera sensor, or if you're old like me, onto your film. It's that simple, right? Exposure is figuring out how to get the proper amount of light to capture the image the way you want. Or it's that complicated. How do we control exposure? What is the right amount of light? What is a correct exposure? By adjusting our camera for a proper exposure, what else are we affecting in our photograph? How do the settings that affect exposure affect our photographs in other ways? And what tools does a camera offer to help us set the proper exposure? If we master this skill, we're on our way to taking control of our photographs. We move beyond simply point and shoot and hope. Okay, so let's begin. In the age of Photoshop, why does it even matter, right? If we can lighten and darken and adjust and manipulate an image in the computer, why worry? A camera sensor is not nearly as complex or flexible as the human eye. Our eye can see a tremendous range of brightness and wide range of color. Sensors get better and better daily, even hourly it seems, but they are still way, way behind our eye. When we look at a scene, our eye, with the help of our brain, sees a tremendous amount of information and is constantly adjusting. We can see the subtleties of a puffy white cloud and a bright sky, and then look into the shadows under a tree and make out the details of each blade of grass. Simply put, a camera can't. It wouldn't be able to capture all of that information at the same time. When we take a picture, we are often making a compromise, and that means either the camera is making the decision or we are. We are either pointing and shooting and hoping for the best, or we are setting an exposure to capture what we want if part of our photo is so bright that there is no detail, a very bright sky for example, no amount of Photoshop can fix that. And if there are areas of the photo that are pure black, again, we can't fix that in the computer. There's no information to, to restore, no information to, to um, uncover. If a photo is too bright, we call that overexposed, while the reverse, a too dark photo, would be underexposed. But as we'll explore in this video, under, over, and properly exposed is a little like Goldilocks. Maybe the porridge is too hot or too cold for her, but maybe you like your porridge hot or your bed soft. Proper, what a proper exposure is, depends. We have three ways of controlling the exposure. You'll sometimes hear it referred to as the exposure triangle. We have ISO, shutter speed, and aperture. Those are our tools, our, our controls. By adjusting any one of them, we can lighten or darken an image. And if we want, we can compensate for changing one by changing one or both of the other two in the opposite direction. That's why we call it a triangle. When we take a photograph, light enters through the lens and then hits the sensor at the back of the camera. Add just the right amount of light and you get the exposure you want. It's like filling a glass with water. Too much water and it overflows. Your photo is overexposed. Too little water and your photo will be too dark. We will learn to adjust each of these settings. How, and just as importantly, why we might choose to change one, ISO for example, rather than shutter speed or aperture. Let's look at ISO first. ISO is the size of the glass. It's a measure of the sensitivity of the camera to light. If we raise the ISO settings, the camera becomes more sensitive to light so we need less of it, a smaller glass. ISO settings typically start at 100 or 200 and can go up and up and up from there. Each time you double the ISO, you are doubling the sensitivity to light. 200, twice as sensitive as 100, 400, four times as sensitive as 100, etc. So ISO 6400, the highest really usable setting on the D7200, is 64 times more sensitive to light than the lowest setting of 100. More expensive cameras might allow an ISO setting of 25,600 or 52,000. Nikon's newest flagship, their new D5 that was just introduced, brags of an upper limit of 3,280,000. 3 million, it's crazy. That would be a very, very small glass because we wouldn't need very much water, or very much light, right, to get a proper exposure. Shutter speed is how long we turn on the faucet. A camera has a shutter, basically a black curtain that covers the sensor, and it opens and closes to allow light in for a specific amount of time, usually measured in very small fractions of a second. 
You'll notice on some cameras, like the D7200, the display doesn't show a fraction, but, but that's what it means. So when it shows 100, it means 100th of a second. 1,000 would be 1,000th of a second. Exposures longer than a second are possible as well, but typically those would be done with a tripod under, under special circumstances. So as we raise the shutter speed from, say, 100 to 1,000, which is 100th of a second to 1,000th of a second, we are letting in less light. If nothing else changes, our photos will get darker and darker. Finally, the third leg of the, of the triangle is aperture. Aperture measures how large the opening is for light. Do we turn on our faucet for a trickle or full blast? Do we let the light in through a small opening or a very large one? We measure the size of this opening in f-stops. Confusingly, the larger the f-stop, the smaller the opening. So an f-stop of 11 lets in less light than f4, for example. That's because f-stops, just like shutter speeds, are really fractions, but we rarely refer to them that way. So we'll write it out as f over 4 or f over 5, 6, and if you think of those as fractions, you may more quickly remember that larger f numbers mean less light. I'll admit, this trips up students all the time when they're first starting out. It doesn't seem intuitive as the numbers get bigger that we're letting in less light. But take your time, think it through, practice, eventually it becomes second nature. Hopefully what is obvious is that if you use a faster shutter speed, which lets in less light, you'll need to compensate, right? So how do you do that, you ask? Well, one of two ways. Quick, hit the pause button, think it through. I'll give you a second. Okay. So, you go to a faster shutter speed, say from 1 2 50th of a second to 1,000th of a second. You are letting in less light. How much less? Four times less, right? 250 to 500 would cut the light in half. 1 500th of a second to 1,000th of a second would do that again. So to compensate, you could raise your ISO, make the camera more sensitive to light so it needs less. If you go from ISO 200 to ISO 800, you've doubled it twice, made your sensor four times more sensitive, canceling out the faster shutter speeds effect on light. Or you could use a larger aperture. You could go from f16 to f8. Okay, so these f numbers are not really intuitive when you first look at them, and they don't make sense on their face value. But trust me that f16 to f11 doubles the amount of light, and f11 to f8 doubles it again. If you're really curious where those numbers come from, you can ask me or you can always use our friend Google. The important part here is that we can adjust ISO or aperture to compensate for changes we might make to shutter speed and vice versa. That's the exposure triangle, the relationship between ISO, shutter speed, and aperture in creating a proper exposure. The size of the glass is the ISO. How much light do we need? It depends on the ISO setting. Select a higher ISO and we need less light. Shutter speed is how long we turn on the faucet and aperture is how fast the water flows. We can fill our glass in different ways. We can let the water come out slowly for a long period of time, or turn the faucet up for a shorter period of time. The end result is the same. And that's how our camera works. We can get the same amount of light to the sensor in different ways, and we can change the size of the glass by adjusting the ISO. At this point, I hope you're asking yourself a question, right? If there are all sorts of ways to get that proper exposure, why does it matter? Why not just turn the camera to its automatic setting, point and shoot and hope? And the answer is because each of those settings affects our photos in ways beyond exposure in both good ways and in bad. So how do we actually set the settings we need to set? This demonstration uses the Nikon D7200. If you're using a different camera, the location of buttons and knobs will be different. You'll need to Yes, look at your camera's manual or look online. Remember that Penn State students have free access to lynda.com, a wonderful resource for tutorials on all things digital, and you can always email your professor. We have multiple exposure modes available to us. These are the different settings that allow us more or less control of the camera. They range from the fully automated program mode where the camera sets everything, to modes where the camera will assist us, to fully manual, we control all the settings on the camera. To begin, let's work in manual mode, the M setting on the camera. This will allow us to learn how the camera works. At the end of the tutorial, I'll explain some of the other settings and, and why we might use them in different circumstances.
Setting the camera to M means you have to manually set the ISO, shutter speed, and aperture. This gives you full control of the exposure. On the D7200, we change settings using the command knobs as we discussed in the camera tutorial. Press and hold the ISO button on the lower left and use the command dials to change the setting. We want auto ISO off, so use the front command dial to change this setting. Then use the back command dial to change the ISO settings. Remember, higher ISOs make the camera more sensitive to light. So when would we use this? When we need our camera to be more sensitive to light, right? When there isn't much light to begin with, at night or indoors, for example. A cloudy day would need more light than a sunny day. To photograph in darker situations, we turn up the ISO. When there is a lot of light outdoors on a sunny day, we turn down the ISO. So why does this matter? At very high ISOs, we may be able to capture an image, but the quality will not be very good. How high is high? What is too high? It will depend on your camera. For the D7200, image quality looks very good up to 1600. It looks really pretty good at 3200 and starts to suffer above that number. In general, image quality on older cameras and less expensive cameras is poorer at higher ISOs, and higher end cameras do better. It's definitely a case of you get what you pay for. You can see in the examples that at very high ISOs, colors are less rich and there's what we call digital noise or digital grain. Are the photos still usable? Sure. Do they look as good as images shot at lower ISOs? No. So as a general rule, use the lowest ISO you can. Typically, in bright outdoor light, you will use ISOs in the 100 to 400 range. On an overcast day or in a bright indoor setting, you'll likely shoot in the 400 to 1600 range. And in darker situations, you'll move up to 3200 and, and beyond if necessary. Remember that higher ISOs make the camera more sensitive to light, so they allow for things like faster shutter speeds or smaller apertures. And there may be reasons to use those in different kinds of situations and adjust the ISO accordingly. Typically, I will set my ISO first based on the brightness of the location. It's important to remember that while high ISO image quality isn't as good as lower settings, we should use those settings when necessary. A picture that is too dark or blurry isn't usable at all. A sharp, well-exposed photo with some digital noise may be very useful to us. After setting the ISO, I'll adjust shutter speed and aperture. Use the back command dial to set your shutter speed, and the front command dial sets the aperture. How do you know what the correct exposure is? In manual mode, the camera displays an exposure scale, a meter. Look through the camera's viewfinder, lightly depress the shutter button to turn on the camera, and you'll see a display at the bottom of the screen. It shows shutter speed, aperture, and then an exposure scale. Unfortunately, I can't show you the view as you'll see it looking through the camera, but the live view is similar, so I'll use that for this demonstration. But please, when you are shooting with a camera that has a viewfinder, use it. Don't hold your camera out in front of you and use the screen. It is very difficult to hold the camera steady this way. Put the camera up to your eye and take advantage of the viewfinder. All right, notice the display in live view. At the bottom of the screen, we see the shutter speed, in this case actually represented as a fraction. We see the aperture as an F number, and we see the ISO, the exposure triangle. Along the right-hand side, we see the exposure meter. The camera is showing us what it thinks the correct exposure should be. By changing any of the exposure triangle parameters, ISO, shutter speed, or aperture, we adjust the exposure. When the scale is only under the zero, the exposure is, quote, correct or at least the camera thinks it's correct. If the scale is towards the plus, the camera thinks the image is overexposed. If the scale is moving towards the minus sign, the camera thinks we are underexposed. So this is the final piece of the puzzle. What is a correct exposure? The camera looks at the light entering the camera, but it doesn't interpret that light through your eyes. And the camera has limits. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, it can't always capture the full range of information in a photo. Let's look at these images of our friendly little gnome. We can adjust the camera so the details of his face are clearly visible, but the background is very overexposed. There's no detail in the sky. Or we can expose so we can see the details in the sky, but our gnome is silhouetted. So what's the correct exposure? Both? Neither? You decide? It depends on what you want to capture.
In this image, the shape of the gnome is interesting, so a silhouette is effective in creating something visually compelling. But if you frame him in a different way, the silhouette is just a blob, not very interesting. On the other hand, seeing his face, his expression, the colors, all of that might be important to a photograph. Imagine if this were a portrait of a, of a person and we wanted to see what they looked like. So the choice is yours. What are you trying to say with your photo? This is a reason we use manual to set our exposure because we want control over how the photo interprets what we see in front of us. Not all scenes are so extreme, of course. Usually we want an exposure that captures the widest range of information possible. One last tool, the histogram, will help us set this exposure. This display can be shown on the camera, and we'll see it in Photoshop as well. It gives us a visual representation of exposure. Think of it as a graph plotting the range of brightness. If there's an area with a lot of highlights, with a lot of whites, those will show larger on the histogram. If all of the information of the histogram fits inside the graph, we know we've captured all the information possible. If the curve of the histogram, what I sometimes call the mountain, is shifted too far to the right or to the left, information is lost. Either the image is overexposed or the image is underexposed, and anything outside the graph can't be retrieved in, say, Photoshop or another image editing software package. So we need to circle back to why does shutter speed and aperture matter beyond exposure? Why not just set any combination of shutter speed or aperture to get the proper exposure that we want to capture? It's a little more obvious, I think, with shutter speed. If the shutter speed is too slow, things that are moving will be blurry. If the shutter speed is so slow that we can't hold the camera steady, the entire picture will be blurry. At slower shutter speeds, it's difficult to hold the camera steady. We often end up with blurry photos. As a rule of thumb, if we can keep our shutter speed over, say, a hundredth of a second, we have a good chance at holding the camera steady. But holding the camera steady is really only half the battle, right? If our subject is moving, we need a shutter speed that is fast enough to freeze their motion if we want a sharp photo. If we're photographing an athlete, if we're photographing a car, if we're photographing a little kid on a tricycle, any subject that moves quickly will be blurry unless the shutter speed is fast enough. So for sports, we might be talking shutter speeds of a 500th of a second, or, or even better, a thousandth of a second, or a two thousandth of a second, to really freeze the motion of a running football player or tennis player or something like that. So shutter speed matters in terms of freezing action. We might also use shutter speed creatively to intentionally create a blur, something we'll talk about in later lessons. Aperture affects what we call depth of field, how much of the image is in focus. So if I focus on my gnome, for example, or on my dog or cat, what's in focus in front of and behind the dog or cat or gnome, right? Or is the background blurry? Is the background less blurry? Is the background in focus? The smaller the aperture, and remember that means a larger number, the smaller the aperture, the larger the number, the more depth of field we have, the more will be in focus behind and in front of our subject. Sometimes we want a lot of depth of field. Everything in the photo is important. We want to see our subject, but we also want to see the trees behind them or the building or whatever the details might be. Other times we want to isolate our subject. We want the background out of focus. Using aperture is one way we can control exactly how the image is represented and exactly what is in focus. And again, that's something we'll talk about more in the future, but understand that's why aperture and shutter speed and ISO matter. They affect exposure, critically important. We have to get exposure right, but they also affect the quality of the image, something else we need to be considering as we move forward. So one final thing I want to cover are the different exposure modes available to us through our cameras. In this tutorial, we've been using manual mode, which means we've set both ISO and shutter speed and aperture, all three pieces of the exposure triangle, to set a proper exposure. And the advantage of the manual mode is that first it teaches us exactly how to use the camera and makes us uh, conscious of all three parameters when it comes to exposure. And it gives us total control. We get to decide how the picture is going to look. We decide whether something should be brighter than the camera might think or darker than the camera might think because we have made decisions about what's important visually. 
The disadvantage of the manual mode is it requires that we're constantly adjusting and thinking as conditions change. Now, if you're in a scene uh, where the light is constant, once you've set your exposure, you don't have to think about it. So you're indoors under you know, fluorescent lights, for example, that's not going to change. You can move freely around the room once you've set your exposure. But if you're outside and it's partly cloudy and the sun is moving in and out of the clouds or, or just the day is getting later and the light is changing, you may need to be adjusting your exposure pretty regularly. So the camera does offer modes that will assist us or take control of the exposure. If you look on the top command dial, which is on the left-hand side of the D7200, you'll see uh, letters, the M that we've been using for manual exposure, P, S, and A. The P is for program mode. That means the camera is setting both aperture and shutter speed, though not ISO. So once you've set an ISO, the camera will, will set an exposure. It may be great, it may not. It may take into account your concerns about shutter speed, it may not. So while you don't have to worry about exposure, you still need to worry about is the shutter speed appropriate? Is the aperture giving me the depth of field that I want? The S mode is for shutter priority. You set a shutter speed and the camera picks out an appropriate aperture to give you the correct exposure or what it thinks is the correct exposure. That can work great. You pick a shutter speed because you know you're shooting fast action, so you pick a fast shutter speed or, or whatever it might be. The camera will set an aperture to give you an exposure. The problem is if there isn't enough light, if the camera goes to the largest aperture and that's still not enough, the camera can't do anything. And so your pictures will be too dark if you're not paying attention. The other problem, of course, is you may not like the exposure the camera picks. Uh, though it does a good job most of the time, there may be circumstances where you want to override what the camera is doing. There is on most cameras and on the D7200 a exposure compensation uh, method where you can, in automatic mode, tell the camera, well, make it brighter than you think or darker. So the plus minus button, you can dial in uh, overexposure or underexposure and still be shooting in an automatic mode. In aperture priority, the A button, you set the aperture and the camera would set an appropriate shutter speed. So you could pick an aperture based on depth of field concerns, or you could simply pick the largest aperture the camera and lens offered, knowing then, since that's letting in the most light, the camera would pick the fastest shutter speed available. So sports photographers will often shoot sports in aperture priority, set their camera to the largest aperture available, knowing the camera will then pick the fastest shutter speed available, which hopefully will freeze the motion and movement of the athletes. You'll see other settings on the Nikon command dial and on most cameras. Uh, these tend to be special effects or um, fully automated modes that um, don't even allow you to set an ISO or um, other kinds of what I would call gimmicks or uh, special functions that we won't address in this lesson. Um, you can certainly explore those, but if you want to really learn to understand uh, how your camera works, I would encourage you to shoot in the manual mode, uh, at least to begin with, until you're comfortable setting a proper exposure. So let me try and quickly summarize what we covered today, right? We talked about exposure. Exposure is as basic as it gets. You need to learn how to set a proper exposure before you really can move forward doesn't matter if your picture is wonderful, if it's too dark or too bright and detail is lost or it's just impossible to see what's going on, right? We learned how you control exposure through the exposure triangle of tools. We have ISO, aperture, and shutter speed. And the three of those in various combinations can be set to control exposure. We also learned that each of those settings affects other elements of our picture quality. ISO affects image quality, Shutter speed affects uh, how moving subjects look and whether our photos are blurry. And aperture affects depth of field, how much of our picture is in focus. So it's important not just to set a proper exposure, but to be aware of how our settings are affecting the rest of our image. I think the most important piece of that to remember as a beginner is that if our shutter speed is too slow, the pictures will be blurry. That we can't hold the camera steady in our hands once the shutter speed uh, gets too slow. Once we get below a hundredth of a second, we start to run into a risky area. 
as the shutter speed gets slower and slower, that risk of blurriness increases. So I hope the tutorial made sense. I hope that you now have a grasp of the concept of exposure and the concepts of how to control exposure. But the only way to learn this is to go out and do it. You need to be comfortable enough that you can adjust your exposure in any situation and on the fly so that you can quickly make those adjustments so that you don't miss something that's happening. If it takes you too long to change a shutter speed or uh, turn up or turn down your ISO, the photo you are hoping to capture could easily be gone. What I hope you walk away with today is a conceptual understanding of how to set exposure and what exposure really means and what you're looking for in a proper exposure. But you really need to take this out in the field with your camera and start applying this knowledge uh, to start building up muscle memory so that you can quickly make the adjustments you need so that you can start understanding more quickly how to get your camera set up properly so you can capture the photos that you want to capture.